Hello from Sweden and from Synchrotron. Um, so this is a follow-up video to Proper Bad Science, um, what was it, Synchrotron, Solar and Sleeplessness, which you may have seen or may not. If you haven't, I'll put a link to the bottom. If you haven't seen it, it's probably best just to watch this and to sort of ignore the other one. Um, but I made the video when I was, I was a little worse for wear. Uh, telling you about what we're doing here at Synchrotron, why we're doing it, what a Synchrotron is, that sort of thing. And um, I got quite a few questions um, afterwards because people were confused and concerned um, for a number of reasons. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put right what once went wrong. Okay, um, turns out my supervisor's just seen the video I made the other night, the proper bad science one. Um, so we've both come to the mutual decision that, um, well, he put it that I'm not technically capable of making up for the mess that I've caused. Um, so we've both decided it's probably best that um, he gets involved. So I'm drafting the pro, um, so meet the the new Sam Becker. Hi, um, I'm Tom and I work in the School of Physics and Astronomy at Manchester University. The floppy fringe isn't a, a requirement of the job, it's Brian Cox may have uh, given you that impression. Uh, and so I'm going to answer some of Mark's questions um, from his um, entertaining video. Entertaining video. It's not what he said earlier. It's not what he said. I studied chemistry at Manchester University. Um, I then went on to do a master's in uh, instrumentation and analytical science at UMIST before my PhD at. Um, Liverpool and Surface Science Interdisciplinary Research Centre, um, and that was in investigating titanium dioxide, so um, it's been a, a long standing interest of mine. Uh, I then got work at uh, got a job at uh, UMIS with Wendy Flavel. Uh, we started off in chemistry, but she moved to physics, and I went with her. And um, since then, I've been kind of interested in how molecules attach to surfaces both from uh, developing new photovoltaics and um, in biological systems. Right then, um, so first question, will nanoparticles kill everybody? I've heard various stories, I mean I think Prince Charles also came out and said that nanotechnology uh, is going to turn the, uh, turn the earth into, a, into a, gre a grey goo. Again, I think that's fairly unlikely. There is a science fiction story in which uh, nanobots wandering, um, invade the earth and start taking everything apart. But you know, that's fiction. There is also fiction that, uh, you know, dragons come down and, uh, and fry us all. Dragons. So, yeah, I think it's fairly unlikely that nanotechnology is going to end the earth. In fact, what we're trying to do is use nanotechnology to help people, okay? So, my own research is in um, <coughs> biological interfaces surfaces so one of the things we've been trying to do is to make nanoparticles which we can stick molecules on the surface and actually use them to detect cancer cells for example or sites of injury and then do some useful do something useful there um, we're also looking at sticking molecules on onto nanoparticles to harvest um, the energy of the sun and that's actually the experiment we're doing here the other day I gave an explanation on how the synchrotron works and um, why we're here. I think I used some interesting analogies. Accurate, but interesting. Um, so could you give an explanation of how synchrotron work, but you know, maybe using some, some science? What is synchrotron radiation? Well essentially it was right. You have this kind of inner tube shaped um, steel tube and we inject down a linear accelerator bunches of electrons into there okay you then accelerate these 
um, bunches of electrons up to close to the speed of light. No, much faster than that. Well, I found that scooter. He's not letting me have a go. You accelerate these electrons at close to the speed of light in a circle. And the point is when you accelerate a charged particle close to the speed of light, when you bend it, it gives out radiation from the ring. So the radiation comes out, it's an X-ray, but you know, why can't we just go down the hospital, you know, pretend we broke our leg, stick a sample on our leg, and then we've got an X-ray of our sample and you know, we ain't spent a penny. The reason um, we come to a synchrotron is because the X-ray source that they use in hospitals and the ones we've got in our labs only have a fixed energy. Whereas a synchrotron is kicking out radiation from the infrared right up to hard X-rays. And by selecting particular energies, we can focus on um, certain levels in our sample. He's had me timing him. He's been, he's been doing laps. So this beam line that we're using, we're doing photoelectron spectroscopy. So we tend to use photon energies uh, from the ultraviolet up to soft X-rays. Um, if you look down the end there, you can see the lead bricks which stop the hard X-rays getting to us. They have this very nice safety device down here. Um, do not cross the line. So if you go that side, we die. So we've got a beam. Um, we've got a beam at the right energy. Uh, what do we do with it then? So when the beam hits the sample, it's going to photo emit electrons, which as I said in one of my videos, this is what Einstein won his uh, Nobel Prize for. Most people have heard of Einstein's theories of relativity, but the interesting thing is he didn't win any Nobel Prizes for those. He actually won his Nobel Prize for his work on the photoelectric effect. The fact that the light could transfer energy to electrons, and the electrons would come out of the surface, it's called photoemission or the photoelectric effect. And this should be looking now for a titanium peak, okay? So you can see this window up here is black at the moment. So what we should see here is when I open the valve, you might hear a hissing sound. We should start to see counts. We should start to see electrons hitting this screen. So what we've got is a phosphor screen. So when the electrons hit it, we get a, we get a white spot on here. We should also see a peak come up here, and that's due to the presence of titanium in our sample. <coughs> OK. Okay, so you can see this screen now. We've got these electrons hitting the, the screen, and we see this peak here due to the titanium. So now we can make our measurements. Right, so we know why we use x rays. Uh, we know what happens if we shine them on our target. Um, so before we're looking at titanium. Um, but why do we do it, and what do we actually? learn from it. We're looking at titanium dioxide because it's potentially a powerful photocatalyst and the material can generate both fuel and electricity from sunlight. The problem is that it absorbs in the ultraviolet which is why it's used in sunscreen. Okay, it stops the ultraviolet getting into your skin and burning you. It doesn't absorb in the visible part of the spectrum, so the colours of the rainbow which make up white light. So what we do is we stick a molecule on the surface usually a coloured one, and that molecule absorbs visible light and it excites electrons. For God's sake! We use the photoelectric effect um, that I was talking about earlier, but now instead of exciting the electron right out of the sample, we excite it to a higher level. The electron can then transfer into titanium dioxide, we can make a circuit and the electron can go around and do electrical work. What Mark's doing in his project is trying to use titanium dioxide to, form, um, to split water to form oxygen and then we'll have another part of the cell which does the splitting water to form hydrogen. Unbelievable. What we can do with um, photoemission is that we can work out where the energy, or we can measure where the energy levels are, both in the dye or the molecule and in the titanium dioxide, and make sure they line up so the electron can transfer efficiently from the molecule to the titanium dioxide when we excite it with sunlight. Oi! Oh. 
Can't you leave the sign? What? Oh. <coughs> the other thing we want to be sure of when we're looking at stainless steel oxide uh, as a photovoltaic material to capture sunlight and convert it to electricity or to act as a photocatalyst lies in the fact that titanium dioxide is a photocatalyst. So if we can stick a molecule on the surface, it might be that light will actually cause that molecule to decompose, and obviously it's not then going to do the job. So one thing we can do with photoemission is monitor the stability of molecules when they adsorb on the surface or they stick to the surface. So one thing I noticed yesterday is um, there is a lot of pumps, and a um, hell of a lot of pumps, and everything is really important that we get this vacuum. and. I guess there's different levels of vacuum. My, my mum's got a really good Dyson. I could suck up anything. My dad sucked a mouse up with it once. And mum weren't happy. Um, but why Why all the pumps? Let's buy. There are two reasons we work in ultra high vacuum. Okay, so we have to have this big steel can um, with, with an ultra high vacuum inside it. Firstly, the electrons that come out of our sample, very small, very light, so they're likely to be scattered by atoms if they collide into them. So if we work to atmospheric pressure, we've got millions of atoms around and the electrons won't travel very far. They'll lose their energy by being scattered by an atom. And we want to know what energy they have when they come out of the solid, not what energy they have when they're scattered by some gas molecules. The other reason is that we want to control the chemistry of the surface very carefully so we can get our samples atomically clean with no contamination so that we know that any effects that we're seeing are purely down to a molecule on the surface and the substrate or the titanium dioxide crystal that we're investigating. As for all this stuff really, as Mark said yesterday, most of it is pumping in order to help us attain the ultra high vacuum that we need. So the pressures we work at, uh, the low 10 to the minus 10 millibar regime, uh, which is an even higher vacuum than space, okay? In space, you're looking at 10 to the minus 5 millibar, so we've got pressures which are more than a million times lower than in outer space in the interstellar medium. Right, um, so that's it. That's proper good science, and um, I hope you've enjoyed it, um, as opposed to proper bad science. Um, also, this is the end of the synchrotron run from us, so we've been here eight days. I think we're both starting to get a bit of cabin fever. Um, Ready to die now. Yeah, it's... <laughs> it's uh, it's been heavy.